Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me, but if you could uh, shoot something up in that question box, and uh, then I can uh, uh, know that you, you can uh, hear what we're doing. So it looks like you guys can. Uh, tonight, uh, I have uh, Dan Passarelli online, and uh, he's agreed to speak to us about uh, time spreads and about management concepts related to time spreads. Um, real quick, let's take care of the, uh, the legalities here. Uh, keep in mind that this is an educational presentation. Nothing that I uh, say during the presentation and nothing that Dan says during the presentation should be considered investment or uh, legal or tax advice. And then you need to rely on your own due diligence and your own advisors for that sort of advice. Um, and to the extent that you uh, are presented with any kind of uh, historical uh, data or uh, uh, testing results, just remember that um, these are hypothetical in nature and may not reflect actual market returns. And um, with that, I'm going to turn you over to Dan. Uh, Dan Passarelli is uh, the founder of Market Taker Mentoring, and uh, he's got about 18 years of experience in the industry. He has published a couple books. Uh, including one on trading option Greeks and the market taker's edge. And um, he uh, has quite a bit that he can offer. And uh, tonight we're going to focus in on time spreads. So, uh, Dan, if you're ready to go, um, I'm going to make you the presenter and, and we can get this show on the road. All right. So you should have a button on your screen that lets you uh, become the presenter now. I do. Okay, now I can see your screen. Okie dokie. Well, uh, hello everyone. Welcome and uh, how's everybody doing tonight? This is, a, this is a late presentation for me here in Chicago, man. It's like 8 o'clock. I'm, I'm ready to uh, call it a day. But you know what? I talked, uh, I talked to Chris, and he said that you guys were a really great group. And um, I agreed to stay up past my bedtime. Well, actually, it's not past my bedtime, but, you know. And hello, Raul. How you doing? All right. So here's what we're uh, – <laughs> yeah, I guess it's not that late. So here's what we're going to be talking about today, adjusting time spreads. How many time spread traders do we have here? If you guys trade time spreads, go ahead and type a, you know, a Y or, or say me or something like that. Let's get a feel for, for the room here. <coughs> yeah, okay, that's kind of what I thought. You betcha, that's right, okay. Yeah, this is kind of what I thought. I figured this would be a kind of sophisticated group. So. Um, and sell options for time. Yeah, that's the way to do it, isn't it? <clears throat> so here's the thing. You know, putting on a time spread, that's great. That's one thing. Making money at it, sometimes that can be a whole other thing. I mean, trading's easy when trades go your way. But when trades don't go your way, ay ay ay. now you're in trouble. So we're going to talk today about adjusting time spreads. Before we do, I need to point out that options are not for everyone. You should read characteristics and risks of standardized options before trading. And you can get a copy of that by calling 1-888-OPTION. All righty. Lots and lots to talk about tonight. Quick review on time spreads. Looks like there was a, a good number of you who understood them, but uh, you know, I, I got a couple of non-responses here as well. So, quick review: we're going to talk about rolling and legging and adjusting the whole gamut. Quick time spread review, and for those of you who don't trade them, I'm assuming you're at least somewhat familiar with these. You may have heard people refer to spreads as calendar spreads or if they're like, you know, they hang out with your great-grandfather and they trade options, they might refer to them as horizontal spreads, archaically. K 
calendar spreads, horizontal spreads, time spreads, all the same thing. Synonyms, not even slightly different, same thing. Here's what they are. You buy one option and you sell another that is the same type, that is they're both calls or they're both puts. Both of the options share the same strike, but they have a different month. Now, this is a general definition. I mean, I traded on the floor of the CBOE. You know, it may be a little bit different than what uh, a lot of what I call stay-at-home traders do. Sometimes I buy time spreads. I generally prefer to buy time spreads. But sometimes I'd sell them, you know, because I was more of a volatility trader. <coughs> Definitions of both. A long time spread or when I buy a time spread means I'm buying the option with more time until expiration. And because they're the same strike, i.e., the longer term option must have greater value, just logically. A short time spread or when you sell a time spread means you're selling the option that has more time until expiration, i.e., the one with greater value. That's a credit spread. The long time spread, that is a debit spread. You're paying for it. So look, here is AT&T. And by the way, none of the prices here are current. I mean, first of all, it's after the market closed. Second of all, you know, none of these things are recommendations or anything like that. So I prefer to use stuff that's uh, at least slightly out of date so nobody thinks I'm trying to recommend anything. <clears throat> so the August-October 30 call time spread in AT&T at 52 cents. Right? So here's what we do. We buy the longer term October 30 calls for 75 cents. And we sell the shorter term Octo or excuse me, the shorter term August 30 calls at 23 cents. 23 cents. And by the way, Scott says, do you classify a diagonal spread as a time spread? Uh, yes, yeah, Scott, I mean, a diagonal spread is in the time spread family. You know, just a straight time spread, you want a classic textbook definition. That's what I gave you on the other screen. But, um, you know, it's in the time spread family. I mean, diagonal is also in the vertical spread family for what that's worth. Also, it's a combination of the two. So, you know, simple, fairly straightforward here. By the October 30 calls sell the August 30 calls. In this case, when you have a stock like AT&T, where the markets are a gosh darn penny wide, you're not middling that. You're buying the offer on one, selling the bid on the other one. You know, you try and do two offers or two bids, and I don't know, you might have a slight chance, but probably not unless the market makers are all long or all short the spread already. <clears throat> now, here's a way that I look at risk when it comes to any type of trade. And this is a good thing to keep in mind. I think if you kind of keep this in the back of your mind, you're going to have a more clear visibility on what you need as far as tools are to analyze risk. Two ways of looking at option risk. Absolute risk and incre incremental risk. Absolute risk, that is, as the name implies, just absolutely, under any circumstances, the most you can lose or the most you can make. That assumes all the time value is gone. It's all intrinsic value. <clears throat> if it's out of the money, you know, I either have 100% loss on the time value or 100% profit if I sold it, time value. If it's intrinsic value, it's worth what it's worth. And then there's incremental risk, which arguably is more useful. That measures the incremental changes in the pricing factors that affect options. So like if today the stock goes up a buck, I have a time spread on, how much money do I lose? You know, I'm not saying to hold this until expiration, look at a P&L diagram like absolute risk measures. I'm saying, you know, stock moves a little, how much do I lose? Or a week passes, how much do I lose or make? of line. Or if implied volatility changes or converges between the two months, 
how much do I make or lose? For this, we need the Greeks. Time spreads, you know, time spreads, you can't really draw an accurate profit and loss diagram, like an ad expiration profit and loss diagram. It doesn't work because there's not an ad expiration diagram. When one option expires, you still have the other one that has, you know, probably will have some time value left to it, and we don't know what the volatility level is going to be, which is why you can't draw a P&L diagram. So, you, you know, you, it's helpful to use those. Those you have, like, you know, think or swim or, you know, really any of the major um, online options-friendly brokers, they'll draw a P&L diagram, like, using today's numbers with today's volatility. That stuff is help, helpful, but it doesn't really tell the whole story. It's a two-dimensional diagram of a multi-dimensional puzzle. You need to use the Greeks as well if you're going to be successful trading time spreads. So here is just, you know, yeah, 3D chess, right, Ray? Absolutely, right on. <clears throat> Whoops. I knew that was going to happen. Okay, so here is like a loose representation of what a P&L diagram of a time spread looks like. It's useful just to conceptualize. There's like only one point on this diagram that you can actually state accurately. That's the maximum loss only to the downside. To the upside, you can't really tell the maximum loss because of interest and such. You can't tell the maximum profit because you don't know what the implied volatility of the long-term option is when the short-term option expires. Um, you can't tell the break-evens for that same reason. Guillermo, hey, wasn't I emailing with you today, Guillermo? I think I was. And Guillermo says, what about the calendar options? Is that the same? As Sarah Palin would say, you betcha. It sure is. Uh, synonyms. <clears throat> you don't remember if you're emailing with me? Well, I guess I'm not an exciting emailer. Okay. More important, huh, you're welcome, more important than the P&L diagrams are the Greeks, by far. That's the only way you can really accurately measure your risk. So here are, in general terms, how this works with time spreads. Delta can be positive or negative, okay? You're long the long-term option, short the short-term option. The thing is, is because you have negative gamma, if the stock is above the strike, you get negative delta. If the stock is below the strike, you have positive delta. <laughs> and what that does is it acts kind of like a rubber band. When you get too far away from the strike, you feel the need to have the stock get pulled back to the strike, although it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes the rubber band breaks and you're in trouble. When the stock gets too far below the strike, you get, keep getting more, more and more positive delta. You need that thing to get back to the strike price. Theta is the whole raison d'etre of this trade. Short-term options have a higher rate of theta than long-term options. You're selling a short-term, buying a long-term, therefore you end up with positive theta. That's the name of this game. Now, you have positive vega, and, you know, that's going to be more of a discussion point a little later. Although you have positive vega with a long time spread, that can be misleading. Although you can look at the net theta, you can look at the net delta, and you can look at the net gamma, you can't necessarily look at the net vega. You need to look at the implied volatility of both the long option and the short option because they can converge or they can further diverge. And when you put these things on, by the way, a little aside, I forgot whether or not I put this in the presentation, but here's something a lot of people don't teach and I don't understand why they don't. When you trade a time spread, it's not just about thinking, hey, I'm going to be in a range. I mean, it is. You have to be in a range in order to have a profit. 
But in order to construct off the bat a smart time spread and minimize your need to adjust, in order to construct a smart time spread, the option you're selling must, must, must have a higher implied volatility than the option you're buying. If not, you're putting on a trade for negative edge and professional traders would laugh at you because you are putting yourself at a statistical disadvantage. I'm not saying the trade's never going to work out. It will sometimes, but you're selling something that's too cheap or, well, buying something rather that's too expensive or, well, really both. <clears throat> trading is all about odds. It's all about, you know, when you're putting on a trade, it's all about getting a statistical advantage. If you're not selling a higher volume than you're buying, you're giving yourself a statistical disadvantage, exactly the opposite of what any good trader strives to do. So a little aside in case you didn't know that. <clears throat> okay. So planning a time spread, when you first initiate it, you need to do three analyses. This is the same with any option play. There's always three analyses. The trifecta of analyses is technical, fundamental, and volatility analysis. You do them all. Leonard here has a question. Let's see what Leonard has to say. I'm sorry that it keeps uh, doing this when I check the questions, but uh, what are you going to do? How, oh, Leonard, that is a great question. So I just got done saying sell a higher vol than you buy. Leonard says, well, how much higher? What's the differential? <coughs> oh, and and Ramet asks, is it okay to ask questions? Absolutely. You know, if I start getting too many during the presentation, I might hold some off till the end. But you guys who ask these, you know, timely questions that uh, enrich the presentation, that helps everybody. So go ahead, go for it. Save some till the end, too. <clears throat> um, OK, so the volatility points should be at least two points different. The short should be at least two points above the long, but no more than 20 points. And in some stocks, I'd say maybe no more than 12 points. But you know, let's, let's stay general. More than two, less than 20. That's because if it's more than 20, that's a sure tail sign that uh, there's some trouble cooking and you're just missing something. <coughs> so you do your technical analysis, look for a channel. You do your fundamental analysis, make sure earnings is not imminent. Do your volatility analysis, make sure you get that at least two points, less than 20 points. Generally, what I like to choose in selecting the right month, pick them three months apart. Why? So you can roll. I love to roll month after month with time spreads when I can. You can't always. And you know, the market lately has been a challenge for time spreads. Um, it's been a challenge for time spreads, but it's not to say that you can't trade them. Front month vol is higher than uh, back month vol in many cases. But the thing is, is that um, we're moving around a lot, man. Ken asks, can I give an example of two-point differential? Yes. <clears throat> Difference, you know, you buy a December option that has a 47 vol and sell an October option that has a 49 vol. See? <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, and David, yeah, volatility is implied volatility, exactly, right, because that's the way to look at implied volatility, that's the price of your options, all else held constant. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. I, uh, I opened the floodgates here, and I've got a lot of questions, and I love, I love uh, answering questions, and boy, I'll stick around and answer questions as long as I can here. And Ken, it's the same for stocks and ETFs and indexes corn, anything. Yes, it's the same. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to halt on the questions here just because I want to make sure we have some continuity here in this presentation and not get off track. Okay, so let's talk about a simple technique here, just rolling a time spread. 
that simply closing one leg of a position and opening another leg as a single trade. <clears throat> now, what we're talking about specifically here in rolling a time spread is we're specifically talking about rolling out in time. <clears throat> okay, example. We buy the January, the longer term January 55 calls, sell the April shorter term 55 calls, pay a net, diff, a net debit of 205. Okay. Obviously, you know, we look at the price of the stock here, it's 54.76. If you get time spreads or if you're able to grasp what I talked about in the crash course here in the beginning of this presentation, we want the stock to stick around 55, you know, the shared strike price. We think the stock is not going to move too much. Now, here's the thing. Um, we put on that trade, we bought the Januarys, we sold the Aprils. Between April and January, we've got like eight months or something or other. Um, let's assume that the trade is profitable. April expiration rolls around, and winter, winter, chicken dinner, we're sitting on a profit. We've got three choices. We say, Thank you very much, Option Gods, for answering my prayers. Um, I'm going to take this money that you have, be, you know, given me this bounty, and I'm going to go blow it on liquor or whatever suits your fancy. Or you can let the April expire, and you can keep the January call. So basically, it's kind of like you own the January call at a discount. Now, the only reason you would do that is if you're bullish, right? Why do, why do you want to be along a call? Because you're bullish. Really, why would you want to close the trade? Because you no longer think the stock's going to be neutral. If you think the stock's going to be neutral, then you would roll the April to May and keep the position going. So really, you know, you don't roll every time. Anybody who rolls every time is going to get run over sometimes. You've got to be a little selective. So basically, like we're talking, I think it's going up, I think it's going down, I think it's staying neutral, or gee whiz, I don't know. Gee whiz, I don't know, is close the trade. I think it's going up is keep the January. I think it's going down, well, the nothing here. You need to sell your call and maybe buy a put. I think it's going to be neutral still. Let's continue it. Roll the April short call to a May and just keep that January. So here's what you do. <clears throat> Original trade, long the Jan 55 calls to 275, short the April 55 calls to 270 for a net debit of 205. Here's the roll. And you do this before expiration. You do it after expiration and you're screwing up. You're being basically reckless. Why? <coughs> because on the Monday after expiration, if you haven't already put on the May, if the market goes down a little bit, you'll lose money on your long call and you don't have that offsetting hedge. So maybe you wait till expiration Friday Maybe you do it, you know, sometime during expiration week. But the roll is this. Sell the May 55 call at 70 and buy the April 55 call at 5 cents. So basically what you're doing here is you're selling the April May 55 call spread at 65 cents. <coughs> you're trading a time spread to roll a time spread. You're selling its time spread to roll a long time spread. Now, once the April option is cheap enough and, and you're neutral, 
why not roll? You don't have to wait until right before expiration. As long as you think you're going to be neutral, and I mean, look, the thing is, with short options, you guys know the basic mantra like that you learned when you first learned about options. The most you can make when you sell an option is the option premium. Let me give you a little postulate of that. The most you can make on an option at any point going forward is what the option is worth right now. So at some point, when the April 55 calls are worth five cents, the most additional you can make is five cents. So there's no point in keeping that. You have to sell an option that has some meat to it in order to profit from it. Sell so the May option at 70 cents. Now you can make 70 instead of five. Now, what we're looking at here, can you always sell the May 55 call for 70 cents? No, we're making some assumptions. This is kind of like, you know, in like college economics classes, like they say, you know, in a perfect world and like, let's assume, it's kind of what we're doing here, but you guys are smart enough to translate this into real world stuff, which we're still going to talk about, but <clears throat> let's assume there's the same number of days in April to May and the stock just doesn't move an inch. And you can do this at some point. Buy back to April for a nickel, sell to May at 55. Okay? Now, here's why I like this. And again, we're going to go with the same assumptions. Ideal trade con conditions, you profit, the stock doesn't move an iota. Volatility remains constant. And there are the same number of weeks in each expiration cycle. None of these things have to necessarily be, but to make the math clean, and to make it easy for you to understand, we're going with these assumptions. <coughs> so this, I love this. This doesn't happen all the time, but it does sometimes, and when it does, I love it. Let's say we make that trade we were talking about. Buy the Jan at 275, sell the Aprils at 70. Everything works out just swimmingly. April expires, and let's say, I mean, really, like I said, to my point before, we want to roll before expiration but for the sake of making the math easy and clean, we'll say that it expires. And then on expiration, on the Monday after expiration, we sell the May call for 70 cents. Now, we paid 275 for the January. That doesn't change. That's what we paid. Done deal. Each month, we sell a new call at 70 cents after each one expires. So look, after just four months, what happened? We've collected enough premium to pay for the long option that we initially bought. And then after that, it's all gravy. In August, we've collected 350. In Sep, we've collected 470. Basically, at, at that point, and again, this is all predicated on everything working out just perfectly. At that point, it's all gravy. We can't lose. And if we get bullish, guess what? We can stop selling option premium, and we already own the January call for free, and so we can't really lose on that either. This does not set up all the time. It's an opportunistic trade. When it does, hot darn tamale, it's awesome. Um, I'm going to go through a couple questions here now that we've got a break. Alton says, what is a good vol analysis tool? Um, you know, I'm kind of impartial, but, you know, live vol is pretty good. You have to pay for it. I, I never like to encourage people to pay for anything they don't have to. You can get the next best thing by using eye volatility. Um, it's not as good, but it's free. And most online brokers have volatility analysis stuff in there. But, you know, I think with a lot of the ones that I'm familiar with, they're not really easy to read. 
what I like about um, Live Owl is that it's very easy to read, very clear, and the data seems pretty clean too. <clears throat> Ramet says, is it prudent to trade time spreads with weekly options for the short? Darn tootin', if you can, yes. The thing is, is that a lot of times the weekly options are so cheap that it doesn't make for a good time spread. But in those rare occasions when you can find it and it makes sense, it's the best because that's the highest rate of theta. Love it. Okay, let's talk about legging into a double calendar. <clears throat> okay, a double calendar or a double time spread. You know, I tend to call time spreads time spreads instead of calendars, but I tend to call two of them a double calendar instead of a double time spread. I don't know why. <clears throat> a double calendar is just what the name implies. It's two darn calendars at the same time. As a matter of fact, another way you can look at it, another way you can think of it, and another thing you can call it is a stra uh, strangle swap. Basically, you buy a long-term strangle, like maybe you buy the, you know, January 50-55 calls, or excuse me, January 50 puts and the January 55 calls, <clears throat> and then you sell the April 50 puts and sell the April 55 calls. That's one way of doing it. It doesn't have to be one call spread and one put spread. It could be both call spreads. It could be both put spreads. But it's two time spreads. By one call month A, sell another, same strike, different, but a different month, month B. Then by another, you know, either another call or a put, month A, sell another call or put, same strike, different month, month B. Typically, you know, I mean, I could tell you, you know, you, you can do it long or do it short. None of you guys are ever going to short a double calendar. That's purely a professional strategy, purely a vol trader thing. Guys on the trading floor, prop traders, who are just trading vol for you know to capture Vega profits. That's not what you guys are doing. That's not really what I do anymore. We're about theta. The only thing we use really use volatility for is to get edge on trades. <coughs> so here's a call time spread by the. January 55 calls, sell the April 55 calls. Wait a minute. So that's a straight call time spread. That's the one we were looking at. <clears throat> now, again, this is obviously just a loose representation here. You can't really draw a PL diagram for a time spread, but it looks something like this if you could. You need the stock to stay close to 55. If it doesn't, you're in loser territory. So we paid 205. We think the stock's going to stay around 55 by April expiration. What if we're wrong? Any, anybody here ever been wrong on a trade before? Don't count me. You're just going to fill up my questions window. <clears throat> but the answer is yes. The more you've traded, the more you've been wrong and right, but wrong. If the stock falls to like 51 bucks, yee, you can be in trouble. You might need to do some damage control. You might need to adjust your forecast. You know, is it just, oh boy, that shouldn't have happened. I thought I was going to make money. Uh, you know, let's scramble. No, you should have a plan. You should have an exit strategy. But sometimes the market fundamentals change that make your forecast different. Do you expect a retracement back up to 55? Do you expect a dead cat bounce? You're just going to sit here at 51? Is it going to break even further? If you're re expecting a possible retracement or a dead cat bounce, like that's your forecast, I think either we stay here or maybe we rise back a little bit. A good strategy might be to leg into a double calendar. 
So look, here's how that works. <clears throat> here's your original trade. We've talked about that before. Buy one Jan 55 call at 275, sell one April 55 call at, two, at 70 cents, paid 205. When the stock falls to 51, look what happens to your spread. Because of, well, really it's because of negative gammas. Why? It creates negative deltas for you as the stock falls. Your spread gets worth less. Your negative, your short call has more negative gamma than your long call. So you get increasing negative deltas. Basically, your spread goes from 205 to a buck 20. Yuck. Darn it. How am I going to fix this situation? Well, we add a leg. So here's what we'll do. We'll buy the January 50 calls and sell the April 50 calls. So what are we doing? We're putting on a whole brand new time spread. Now, I want you to note something here. Down at the bottom, these last two points here, you know, that's our original time spread. The Jan 55 calls at 275, the April 55 calls at 70. That's where we, we bought it, 205. Right now it's worth about 20. We have lost money on this. <coughs> Doing this double calendar is not a magic wand. It's, it's damage control. It's a way to, you know, recoup back some of our losses and maybe even turn a loss into a profit. But make no mistake, we've lost money because of negative gamma. Okay, so look. Now here's our two trades. We're along these two January calls, the 50-55 call, and we're short the two April calls, the 50-55 call. That for those of you who, uh, I don't know, for those of you who are into um, commodities options, that's what they call it, the commodities exchanges, a stupid. That's the name of the spread, I swear to God. You buy two calls in a row, it's called a stupid like straddle, strangle, stupid. So basically you're long January 50-55 stupid, short the April 50-55 stupid. So now look, <clears throat> here's how this helps. Stock was at 55, now it's down at 51 where my green arrow is. We put on this additional calendar and look what happened. And we've got kind of a saggy circus tent here, but if we stay close to 50 like we are now, we can actually make money. We go back up to 55, we can actually make money. If we're somewhere in the middle, 53 or something, we might, you know, make it a little, a little bit, enough to cover our commissions and then some. So now we've got a way bigger canvas, a way bigger range in which we can have a profitable trade. Nice. But here's the thing. <clears throat> How do you know that it's worth it? Like, you know, it could be a situation where that circus tent sags so far lower that, like, if you are at 53, you actually have a loser. Sometimes, this isn't worth it. Let me explain how to look at this. Let's look at it, and I'm calling this a strangle. It's not really a strangle. It's really a stupid. But, you know, synthetically, I don't know, basically, for all intents and purposes, it kind of is. <clears throat> Only because it's part of a time script. Kind of. Anyway, the 50-55 call soup is six bucks in January. That's what our cost was. But with the move lower, we're re we really own something that's now worth 460. So we paid six bucks for something that's now worth 460. We lost a buck 40. At April expiration, 
assuming the stock stays stable, you know, around 51 or so. Our January options will suffer a little bit of time decay. They'll go from 460 to, say, 445. So we lose another 15 cents, a total of $1.55. But our short-term options are April's. They go from being worth 260, that's where we initially sold both of them, to, well, really they go to a buck because the April 50 calls would be worth a buck with the stock at 51 at expiration. So if that's the case, we make a buck 60 on the Aprils, right? Because we sold both of those at 260. They're worth a buck with the stock at 51. We make a buck 60. And on the Januarys, we lost a buck 55. So we went from a losing trade to about a scratch. If the stock goes a little lower to 50, it's actually a winner. And of course, if the stock goes back up to 55, it's actually a winner. In this case, I'm looking at it, maybe if we're at 53, it might not be a winner. So you, this is how you look at this. What did I pay for the long-term options? And what did I sell the short-term options for? And what's all this going to be worth at expiration? And, you know, you can use the Greeks, theta, to figure this stuff out. If you're a little Greeks challenged, you can probably use, a, you know, the um, diagramming tools on Thinkorswim or TradeMonster or whatever. They'll help you if you can't do the math. Now, well, hold on a second here. <clears throat> I want to answer a couple of questions. Ray says, do you roll the long leg or just the short leg? Just the short leg, Ray, just the short leg. <clears throat> That's why you keep several months in between the short option and the long option. Buy the Jan, sell the April. So then. I can keep the Jan and not pay a commission on another month, not pay another bid ask spread by rolling, just keep that one and only roll one option, only one commission, only one bid ask spread. Good question. Glad to clarify that. Question. Do you have a rule of thumb for the premium received on the short leg as compared to the long leg? Uh, yeah, I mean, I like to get at least at least, let's say, 30% of the cost of the long leg is what I should sell the short leg for. Um, if I can do better, if I can do up to 50%, that's fantastic. We've got lots and lots of great questions, and I'm going to stick around and answer them. I want to show you guys something before we move, before I get to all the questions, though. <coughs> um, I have had some people ask here, and I wanted to just save this until the end, about my classes. Every month I do an online education series. Every month it's on a different topic, like this month has been on managing option portfolio risk. Next month is the best one. It's the market taker mentoring option trading method. I go through my 12 steps for making a trade. Every time I make a trade, I go through these 12 steps. And all my students do as well. It's time-tested, true. <clears throat> there, it's a four-part series presented live online on Thursdays on these dates shown here. I go through finding trades, analyzing trades, selecting the right strategy, planning exits, and monitoring, adjusting, and exiting. I've gotten great, great feedback on things like this I've done in the past. You guys are really, really like this. Um, if you can't make the live ones, that's OK. I record them. You can watch them at 2 o'clock in the morning in your pajamas. 
In fact, they keep the recordings for six months. So in addition to those four live ones, you also get another 24 presentations that are each an hour and 15 minutes long. It's over 30 hours of material. Mastering time spreads, income trades, um, options, execution techniques. In the income trades one, I talk a lot about adjustments. Really useful stuff. Plus my trading tools and online tutorials. Lots of information. This is a limited time offer. I'm actually working with a marketer, and he's having me change my pricing strategy. You won't be able to get this soon. Like, by soon, I mean in another week or two. This is the last time I'm offering this for two dollars or two hundred and forty nine bucks a month. That's it. You guys are active traders like uh, like I hear it's probably less than your commissions for a month. You've probably made or lost more than two hundred and forty nine dollars today. If you want to save a little money, you can get the subscription for six months or twelve months and that brings down your cost significantly. But you sign up month by month, and it's really easy to do. You can sign up here while we're watching this class. Really, you guys are really going to like this. It's bit.ly. There's no .com. It's .ly, kind of a weird URL. bit.ly slash all caps M-T-M-S-E-P, as in Market Taker Mentoring September. bit.ly slash all caps M-T-N-S-E-P. It's easy to sign up. That brings you to the page. It explains it a little better. Sign up with PayPal or sign up with credit card. And uh, you know, you sign up for recurring payments. Don't let that scare you off if you just want to try it out. You cancel any time. You never, ever, ever, ever have to pay more than 249 bucks unless you want to. Truth be told, you're probably going to want to. Most of my people stick around for a couple or a few months. Now, while you're, uh, while, while you're doing the sign-up, and by the way, I mean, I do have limited space in the class, um, and the class starts next week in eight days, so you, you're probably better off signing up now rather than later. Andrew asks, oops, what's going on here? Andrew asks, in both the examples, the IV was larger in the long run. <coughs> Yeah, I don't know. It, it might have been in the I mean, I just pulled up any random option chain just to show you buy this one, sell this one. This is what it looks like. So, yeah, you know, I, I wasn't using that as an example of actually what to look for in getting edge on a trade, just kind of showing basic people what it is. Um, what if vol drops? Should we still keep the jam? Oh, SP, great, great question. <clears throat> SP says, okay, so like if we're rolling, it's April expiration. If volatility drops, do we keep the January options? Maybe. The real thing with these trades are the time decay. The volatility differential is for edge. I mean, if the vol drops on the Jan, great. Sell the higher priced short term. Fantastic. If the vol drops on the short term and the edge is no longer there, like you have to sell the maze at the same price as the Jans or lower, it's not as attractive anymore. I mean, if you're to the point where you've done it a few times, and now, like, you're to the point where you own the free call. I mean, really, at that point, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you're doing it for negative edge. You're just taking in money. So, you know, look at it that way. Gianni says, when you continue rolling during the other months, do you get larger? Do you get a larger break even? But if you have a big move, you might lose the game. How can you lock in some profit? Yeah, Johnny, that's a that's a good question. <clears throat> um, well, once you get to the point of owning a free call, it's no longer an issue. At that point, you really can't lose. 
But until you get to that point, I mean, it's like any other trade. There's risk, and you know it can be a little bit precarious. To get to that point of uh, owning the free call, you know, it's a little bit of a Jenga game, like like any trade is. Um, <clears throat> to lock in some profit, I mean, that's easy. Well, when it works out, that's easy. When you have a profit, if you've done a ten lot and you've rolled a month, rolled a month, hey man, there's nothing wrong with taking off five of them, taking some of that risk off, and then just keeping up the roll. There's one great way to do it. I love doing that. Is it better to roll weeklies on Thursday or Friday? You know, you Charles, you roll when the risk-reward is no longer there. <clears throat> like, in the example, I said, hey, buy the April back at a nickel. That's because you can only make an extra nickel. It's foolish to keep that trade on if it's offered at a nickel. So, you know, I don't care what the day on the calendar says it is. I care about the prices of the options. You roll when the risk-reward is no longer there in that short-term option, and you have to roll out to a longer term. Good, good question. Okay, Don says, with the VIX above 40 in a highly volatile environment, does the rolling strategy make sense? <laughs> does, well, let's start with this. Does the time spread strategy make sense? Let's not say, is it worth doing this three times in a row? Let's say, let's, let's start this with a logical chronology here. Is it worth trading a time spread one time? It's tougher now. The trading's not as easy. A lot of volatility can break through those break-evens pretty easily. But there is the volatility disparity that gets you some edge. You can sell some expensive short-term options and buy some, well, somewhat cheaper long-term options. You don't do this in every stock. You don't say, oh, yeah, today I'm putting on a time spread in Google. I'm going to roll it for seven, seven months. No. But there are, there are some stocks out there where you might find a nice time spread. And when you do, you might be able to roll it. Situational. There is not a single strategy that I teach that you can just use all the time. Anybody who tells you they only trade one strategy and that's the one they use all the time, they don't know what they're doing. Slide 13 shows the short leg with. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we 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 talked about that. Um, John John Dory, we've crossed paths before. How are you, sir? To borrow a phrase from Dan Passerelli, that's me. Being wrong is the reason that drove my trading. <laughs> yes, well, uh, I understand. That's what I'm here for, John. Um, you should sign up for my webinar. I don't remember if you were a webinar, or not webinar, I, um, my online education classes. I don't remember if you were in my online education classes or not. I, I recognize your name. <clears throat> We've corresponded before, I, I think. Um, is the slide, are the slides available after the webinar? Uh, hadn't thought about it. Send me an email and, uh, and I'll see if I can get that done. Okay, uh, Johnny again, how you doing? Says, if price dropped and IV increased, so we both hit IV and Yeah, well, I think this is just kind of a follow-up question to this idea of, you know, hey, if, if I can no longer put on the trade for edge, should I? <clears throat> I mean, like I said, if you get to the point of owning that call for free, I don't care about edge. Before then, I kind of care. Carrie says, idea is to keep crediting your months with the shorts expiring, adding to the total credit, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly, Carrie. That's that's why you roll month after month, just to like you know, the trade work this month. Let's do it again, but we're only rolling one option, <coughs> and so we're just basically 
taking a credit in this month, taking credit in this month. It's like being on, like, you ever see those fishing boat shows that they have on, like, the Discovery Channel in that business where they just, like, drop a net and they pull in a net with all the fish and then they drop the net and pull it in again? That's what we're doing once a month. We do it until we run out of fish or, you know, we get run over and lose money. Um, but you'll have a backup plan in place in order to get out before you lose too much, right? Um, SP says, can we change to credit spread instead of a double calendar? Can you change to a credit spread instead of a double calendar? <clears throat> well, you've already got on one calendar, so to change to a credit spread, it's not a really easy, clean roll. I don't know. I don't know about that one, SP. No better. Um, Elton says, why do a calendar if the range is so small? With follow-up, I cannot see this as an option. Hey, Elton, don't get me wrong. Um, there was a lot of interest in me doing a presentation on adjusting time spread. Right now, like I said, time spreads are precarious. They are pretty darn tricky. I'm not doing as many time spreads as I would be doing if this was like a cool and copacetic market. <clears throat> but I could probably say that for any trade. All trading right now is riskier because of volatility and therefore more rewarding. Calendars are more precarious. There's a greater chance of loss because of the high volatility, but you can put them on for better edge. So David says, is this a trading room? This, my friend, is a presentation to help you become a better trader. SP says, uh, do you normally do options on futures or stocks? I mean, I've traded both professionally. I've traded corn options on the uh, CME, well, board of trade floor, and uh, traded stock options mostly through my career. But um, I don't know. I guess more stock options than others, but it doesn't matter. No, options and options, man. Oh, Craig, great question. Is it better to use put calendars or call calendars? doesn't matter. Synthetically, they are about the same. In fact, synthetically, they're really exactly the same. Uh, Chris says, I'm not seeing the merit of doing the long month so far out. From my experience, when it comes time for the second trade, <clears throat> that strike price is no longer suitable, and the higher price on the long option reduces your overall rate of return. Can you elaborate on why it's worth it? Yeah, Chris, that's, that's, a, that's a good and fair question. <clears throat> um, I used maybe a little bit of an extreme example, buying a January and selling in April. I mean, probably four to five months is about right. I don't know if it's that extreme example now that I think about it. Right now, if you're doing it, yeah, you're not going to be able to roll as easily. Definitely. And you might have to roll into a diagonal, which we ended up not really having time. Yeah, we're at the end of our hour here now. Um, we didn't have time really to talk about rolling into diagonals. <clears throat> um, but there, in the past, I've done this with stocks like 3M and Johnson & Johnson a while back were freaking great for this. I'd roll month after month after month after month after month. And it worked out swimmingly. Um, so, you know, like I said, this is not like universal strategy. Like, 
okay, let's uh, do this on Amazon. You know, if you're doing calendars on Amazon, you don't know what you're doing. Um, this is selective. Look for these stocks that you think will be in range for a long, long time, and, and that's how you plan. Good, great observation and, and question. Um, John says, yes, I took your course on adjusting income trades. Oh, okay, great. Good, good, good. Uh, SP says, what strategies are taught in the October class? <coughs> yeah, SP, some, some of my online series are all about strategies, like I've got one on the vertical spreads. I've got one on time spreads. I've got one on income trades, you know, in general. <coughs> Um, this is more the methodology of trading. I'll, I mean, I'll mention various different strategies, but this is like walking you through the process of how to analyze stuff. You know, reading stock charts, volatility charts, selecting the right strategy. It's, it's more your decision making, you know, in general. Um, and Charles says, if we subscribe now, does that include the entire month of October? Yes, it sure does. If you subscribe now to this online series, <clears throat> on October 1st, I flip the switch, and you get instant access to the last six months, first of all. you know, So that's a total of 24 hour and 15 minute presentations. That's over 30 hours of material. I mean, it's, it's a freaking steal at 249. That's why this marketer tells me I've got to change my price. Um, and so, yeah, you get access to, and you get access to all four of those presentations in October. I mean, honestly, it's, it's the best freaking deal out there. Okay, Charles says, what topics are, in, oh yeah, what topics are included in the past six months? It is, um, it is income trades, it is vertical spreads, it is time spreads, it is getting edge on your trades, option execution techniques like trading against the market maker and middling markets, when to, when not to, you know, how to do it smartly. Um, and one more, what is it? Volatility? No. I mean, all super useful stuff. <clears throat> SP says, is there a newsletter you publish that we can subscribe? Yeah. <coughs> there is a newsletter. If you go to my website, markettaker.com, and you, you uh, right on the home page there, there's a tab for the Market Taker Edge. Subscribe to that. In fact, you get it for two weeks free. So check that out. It's, I mean, it's 79 bucks a month. It's, I mean, it's practically free. Uh, Leonard says, what's my email? It's dan at markettaker.com. Right there. Uh, dan says, you reevaluate your risk reward on positions daily? If so, how? Darn straight, Dan. I sure do. <clears throat> you look, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys my secret. And, you know, there's no holy grail. There's no secret secret. This is something actually that's so obvious. But people don't know how to do this. And I wish I could take credit for making it up, but I, I really didn't. It's really, it's what all floor traders learn. I mean, any good floor trader knows this. Here's what you do every day. When you look at your positions, look at them and say, you know what, if I didn't have this trade on right now, would I put it on at current market prices? If the answer is no, take it off. If the answer is yes, keep it. It just clears your, I mean, because if you don't want to trade on at current market prices, then you shouldn't have it on at current market prices. Right? So you got to pretend like you don't have it and say, would I put this on right now at current market prices? It's just such like a mind freak way to clear your head and make you think, force you to think logically about it. 
I love it. My risk manager when I was uh, a young floor trader explained it that way, and it's brilliant. I, I refer to it as the would I do it now rule in my book, Trading Option Dreams. Um, and we are over, but I'm going to take uh, maybe two more questions. Uh, Paul says, how about index options? Sure, you can do this with index options. Why not? <clears throat> Jay says, instead of adding the double calendar after a drop in price, why not take your additional capital and cost average down on your existing one and sell more front months at a lower strike? Oh, don't do that. <laughs> that is, that is an amateur mistake. People do that and the worst thing that could happen is it works out for you the first time you do it because then you get confidence and you do it again and then it bites you in the butt. Never, ever, ever do that. <clears throat> okay, um, what else? Ray says, thank you for sharing tonight. You're welcome. And uh, one more question here I'll take. If you're moderately bullish into the call calendar, what do you think of selling the next strike up to your long call at the expiration of the short call, leaving a long call spread? Yeah, uh, I, PJ, or, yeah, PJ, I think you're talking about rolling into a diagonal, which somebody else referenced earlier. <clears throat> um, yeah, yeah, I mean, sure, I've done that before, absolutely. You know, it's it's a little different than the straight calendar stuff that we're talking about here today, but yeah, makes sense. It gives you a, a bigger delta, you know, so, so it's a little different of a trade, but you know, if, if you're a little bullish, you might want that slightly longer delta. Okay, everybody, hey, listen, thank you so much for attending. Uh, I got just about everybody's questions answered. Once again, here's the class. Sign up for this. You're not going to want to miss this. You know, for 249 bucks. And and by the way, if you decide to uh, stay month after month, let if you decide to let the recurring uh, keep going and keep taking the class, you're locked into that 249, which you're not going to be able to get going forward. So um, this is like a great time to get in. Anyway, thank you everyone for sharing your evening with me. I always enjoy doing this stuff. Um, if you have questions, you know where to find me, danamarkstaker.com. Be one of the thousands of people who follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash dan underscore passarelli, two S's, two L's, two A's. Have a great night. Talk to you later. See you guys. Bye. Trade smart. All right, everybody. Well, Dan, thanks very much for uh, spending some time with us, and uh, I hope everyone had an opportunity to uh, write down the uh, URL that uh, Dan was sh sharing with us, as well as his Twitter information and email. Um, hopefully, we'll leave that slide. Oh, there goes the slide. Oh, there's back. Uh, so, there uh, <laughs> make notes while you can. Uh, I will. I did record the presentation, and we will make it available in the archive. And uh, I hope all of you guys have a very good night. And uh, um, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot Dan an email and uh, make use of our message board as well. You guys have a good night. Dan, thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Chris. Glad, glad to be here. All right, you take care.